Good morning, viewers. Welcome to Delta Tsome, a program brought to you by Intake Group of Companies. My name is Alex Namtebi, and I'm your teacher for history. So welcome to this episode of History of East Africa. So we are handling all level, and since the senior fours are in school, so I expect the senior threes and senior twos to be seated and ready for this lesson. So our questions are going to be displayed on your screen so you can uh, look at the questions and be able to follow as we discuss. And uh, where you feel you want to ask something, please be free to ask us. So our first question that we are going to handle this morning is why were the Angoni successful in conquering southern Tanganyika? And that question is out of 13 marks. Why were the Angoni successful in conquering southern Tanganyika? So when you're answering a question like this, you have to first of all tell us who the Angoni were. Where did they come from? Why actually briefly were they even interested in conquering East Africa? Then you give us the reasons as to why they were actually successful. Because the Angoni, we are aware that they mainly settled in southern Tanganyika. So the Angoni were the last group of migrants, Bantu migrants, to settle into East Africa. And they are believed to have come from southeastern, uh, in, in, ta, in ta, they are believed to have come from South Africa, that is the Natal province. And the reason as to why they actually migrated, the major reason, was because they were running away from the harsh rule of Shaka, the king of the Zulu. Because the Zulu kingdom was the major kingdom in South Africa, and Shaka had organized military expeditions, and he was uh, making his army undergo a lot of training during a period that was called the Mufakani. So many of the groups that were settling around the Zulu were not willing to be captured by the Zulu. And that is why the Angoni chose to migrate and settled into East Africa, precisely southern Tanganyika. So the Angoni movement was actually an invasion, meaning that when they were moving, they went on capturing the people that they came across. That is why when you're looking at their movement and settlement, they destroyed many of the communities around them. The Shona people, the Chewa people, destroyed the Monomotapa Empire. Even as they settled in Tanganyika, they destroyed um, the, the Hehe, the Sangu. So most of the communities they found along the way, they conquered and they absorbed them into their group. And that is why they were very successful in conquering and settling in southern Tanganyika. So the reasons as to why they were successful were many, and they were actually political, social, and economic, but majorly military, because the Angoni had a very powerful military that enabled them to uh, conquer and defeat many of the societies they found out. Uh, uh, came across and they were able to settle in southern Tanganyika. So we are going to go through the different reasons as to why the Angoni were actually successful in conquering southern Tanganyika. And one of the reasons we are going to start with is the strong leadership. And we can give examples of Zwangendaba. and Maputo. So these were very instrumental leaders of the Angoni. They led their people uh, to southern Tanganyika. And even the challenges that they came across, the societies that they found along the way, they made sure they defeat them. And they gave morale, because the long movement from South Africa to Tanganyika was challenging, but the leaders inspired their people, mobilized them, gave them good leadership until they finally settled in southern Tanganyika. So that is a good, uh, our first reason. The second reason we can look at is the strong army. The Angoni had a very large and strong army. 
which was able to defeat the people that they came across and the communities that they found in southern Tanganyika. So this big army, big and strong army, was not challengeable. It, it managed to defeat most of the communities that they came across, and that made the Angoni to conquer the communities that they came across. So the army had good military tactics. For example, the cow horn method. So the Angoni had this tactic of surrounding their, uh, their enemy at all corners. So whenever they would fight a community, a society, or a state, they made sure that the army would surround the enemy at all corners. So this gave little chances for the enemy to escape and it made the Angoni able to defeat all the communities that they came across. So that is why they were able to settle successfully in southern Tanganyika. So the Angoni were also divided into different age sets. Because we noted that they had a very large army that was not challengeable. So you find out that this army was divided according to the different ages of people. So the youth had the, their own army, the middle aged, and then those that were older. So this army depended on the strength. And when they were attacking the enemy, it depended on the strength of the enemy. So you find out that at all times, the Angoni had an army that was ready to fight a battle and defeat their enemy because they had different armies that were based on the different age sets that were created in the community. So that enabled the Angoni to actually fight their enemies and defeat them. Another aspect we can talk about is the fact that the Angoni fought bare feet. For easy movement. Since they were warriors and they believed that once they are bare feet, they can be able to move freely than when they are maybe in sandals or uh, any kind of shoes. So that is why the Angoni decided to employ that tactic. So they believed they would run faster at their enemy and be able to get them and actually defeat them. So that tactic also enabled the Angoni to fight and defeat the people that they came across and they were able to settle successfully in southern Tanganyika. We can also look at the aspect that the Angoni had spies. They would spy on the communities that they were going to fight. So these spies would uh, continuously give them information about the community that they were going to attack. So this made the Angoni to actually prepare for their battles very well. Because before they engaging into any war, they had to first of all find out who are we going to fight? What is their strength? And can we be uh, able to defeat them? What kind of army are we supposed to send so that we can be able to defeat? So that enabled them to have better preparation. And whenever they went to the battle, the, the battlefield, they were ready because they knew the kind of enemy that they were going to attack. So that it, uh, made it a good, it gave them a better chance of winning than their neighbors or their enemies. So that made them to actually succeed and defeat the enemies that they came across. The Angoni also used surprise attacks. So this means that they conquered or they attacked their enemies by surprise when the enemies were not aware. And these were mainly 
done at night because mainly uh, mostly night time is when people are relaxing people are sleeping people are resting they are not aware of anything that is going to happen and that is why the Angoni decided to organize these surprise night attacks as their enemies were sleeping, as their enemies were off guard, as their enemies were not actually aware that anything is going to happen. That is the time that they attacked them and the chances of defeating them were actually very high because the enemies were found not ready and unaware of the war so that is why they would not be able to defend themselves so that made the Angoni be able to win the people that they came across and they were able to settle successfully in southern Tanganyika. We can talk about the aspect that the Angoni actually rewarded their soldiers They used to give rewards to the soldiers. Anyone that does something good is rewarded for the good work that they have done. So this kept the morale of the soldiers very high. They were able to, uh, they were always eager to go and win and defeat the people that they were attacking because they knew they were getting rewards. They gave them rewards of slaves, they gave them rewards of women or wives, they gave them rewards of grains, beer, and this kept their morale very high and they were eager to fight many battles against the people that they came across and they were able to defeat the people of southern Tanganyika and they settled in the region. So that is also a fact that we can consider and in history the more points you give the more marks that you get. So that is why you, uh, since the question is out of 13, so we cannot give any less than 13. So that is why we have to write as many as possible. So that we can be able to score the 13. So another aspect that we can note is the fact that the Angoni actually looted for food. Whenever they went into different areas, remember the, the soldiers had to be kept strong and in condition, in better condition to fight and defeat their enemies. So that is why they needed food and they made sure that the women were used in looting food so that the soldiers are kept strong and able to fight. So they had plenty of food with them along the way and they would be able to keep their strength and resilience and be able to fight and defeat the communities that they came across. So that is also why they were successful in defeating the people of southern Tanganyika. So we can also look at the aspect that the Angoni were well prepared. and trained for battle. Thangoni went through a series of training. Remember that before they came to southern Tanganyika, they had uh, experienced some of the tactics of the Zulu and the military training that the Zulu were going through. So they learned a lot. So even when they were going into battle to attack the communities that they came across, they were trained and they prepared for the battles very well. And that is why they were ready to fight and they, may, they were able to defeat the people that they came across. You can also look at the aspect that they were naturally warriors. So that is why the Angoni uh, movement was an invasion. They were warriors that had fought many battles in South Africa. They had conquered many of the communities that were 
around them. So even along the way, that warrior instinct was with them. So that is why they were able to actually fight many of the communities that they came across and they were able to defeat them because they were naturally warriors and they could not give in to defeat. So that is why they were able to conquer and succeed. You can look at the aspects that they absorbed the communities. They came across. So as they moved along the way, they went on absorbing many of those small communities that they came across. And this well, these were added to the Angoni community or to the Angoni population. So their numbers were very high. And this increased actually their army. And they were able to defeat the communities that they came across. So this made the Angoni to be very powerful, very strong, many in number, because most of the communities that they came across were absorbed into the Angoni group. So they became very powerful and unchallengeable by many of the communities that they came across. So you can also note that most of the men were joined to the army. So during the different battles and uh, conquests that they did, they captured many people. And most of these captives that were men were joined to the Angoni army. We can look at the like, uh, example of Mirambo, who later uh, f uh, founded the Nyamwezi Empire. So these men that were captured during wars or during conquest, they were added into the army and they were trained and used them to actually fight the, uh, for the Angoni and defeat the communities that they came across. So this made them to create a very large and strong army that was able to fight many battles and defeat the communities that they came across. So we can also look at the fact that the Angoni were experienced at warfare. The Angoni were very experienced. Through fighting many battles with different people, with different communities, they, act, they actually gained experience and resilience and that made them to be more comfortable to fight uh, any community that they came across and they were actually able to defeat them then we can also look at their determination they were very determined they never gave up they knew they wanted to conquer and become very, uh, very powerful so that is why they had to make sure they win the battles that they engaged in They could not give up. They knew the community, uh, they, they knew they had to conquer these different communities and be able to actually defeat them and take conquest. So that is why they were very determined. They could not give up and that made them to succeed in the end. So we are going to take a very short break and when we return, we shall continue with our discussion Welcome back from the short break. So we are going to write just a few ideas on this question 1A and then we can be able to go to part B of the question. So we left on the note that was expressing the determination of the Angoni that made them to actually win the wars that they were fighting. So we can also note the aspect that the communities that the Angoni uh, found or came across were actually small and 
decentralized. So that I'm going to found small and decentralized societies. So these societies that Nangoni came across were actually very small and decentralized. So they could not put up a very strong fight against the Angoni. When you look at examples like the Chewa people of Malawi, the Shona people of Zimbabwe, you look at the Sangu of Southern Tanganyika, those were all small communities that the Angoni were able to defeat because they were experienced at warfare. The Angoni were large in number and so on. So that is why these societies could not put up a very strong fight against the Angoni and they could not actually defeat them. So now we want to go to the part B of our question, which is going to be displayed on the board. And it wants us to actually give the effects of the Angoni migration and settlement into East Africa. How did the settlement of the Angoni affect the lives of the people of Southern Tanganyika? Or oh, the results after the Angoni settling in Southern Tanganyika, what came as a result of that settlement? And the effects were political, social, and economic, because they affected the lives of the people of, South of Southern Tanganyika in those different aspects. So the first effect that we are going to talk about is the increase in population. The Angoni came in very large numbers. And remember they conquered most of the communities that they came across. So there were very many and that led to an increase in population in southern Tanganyika because of the many Ngoni that came and settled in the region. Secondly, the Ngoni absorbed many people. Remember we noted that all the communities that they came across, they absorbed them, they added them to their group and it made the Angoni swell in number and most of these communities became part of the Angoni because they were absorbed into the Angoni community. So that means that these other societies lost their identity because they were now part of the larger Angoni group. So that also led was an effect of Ngoni migration into East Africa. So some were displaced. So many communities that never wanted to be conquered by the Angoni, they decided to move away into safer areas. So that is called displacement. So they had to lose ties of their motherland, the areas that they were living uh, from the start, and go to other areas so that they can escape the invasion or conquest of the Angoni. So that brought about displacement of people because many were displaced to different areas. We can also talk about the aspect of intermarriage. There was intermarriage between the Angoni and the communities that they found in southern Tanganyika, and that brought about new tribes that came as a result of this intermarriage between the Angoni and the people of Tanganyika. We can talk about the aspect of introduction of military skills. Or tactics. 
So the Angoni introduced new methods of fighting or military tactics. For example, the cow horn method. So this method of fighting was actually adapted by some communities in Tanganyika. When you talk about the uh, leaders like Nyungu Yamawe, leaders like Mirambo, the Nyamwezi, they applied actually this Ngoni military tactics because Mirambo was captured as a war, war captive by the Angoni. And he was able to learn some of these military tactics. And he used them to actually formulate or found the strong Nyamwezi Empire in Tanganyika. So these tactics were very helpful to many communities that came, uh, that came across Tangoni. And some of these communities actually learned these tactics and used them against Tangoni in order to defeat and defend themselves. So those were the military tactics. So the Angoni also introduced new weapons. For example, the short stabbing spears. Or the Asegai. So this was also actually a reason as to why the Angoni were successful because they had very strong weapons. And the Angoni believed that the long spears actually, once you throw it at the enemy, you lose it and your weapons reduce. But because they were using short stabbing spears, they could uh, attack the enemy at close range, but they were still able to keep their weapons. And these were adapted by many people of southern Tanganyika and they used them in warfare. So it was also an effect that was brought in by the Angoni. So the Angoni led to the disruption of the long distance trade. Dangoni disrupted the long distance trade because of the invasion, because of the wars that they were fighting. So that insecurity that was caused in southern Tanganyika could not allow trade to take place because many of the people were actually running to secure their lives. Others were displaced to different areas. And during the time of fighting, many could not concentrate in participating in trade and the trade declined especially the central route of the long distance trade that was going through Nyamwezi land because the Tutangoni invaded Tabora which was the land of the Nyamwezi and these were the controllers of the central route of the long distance trade and along during those fights and um, that uh, conquest that Tangoni did the trade was disrupted. It could no longer take place. So that is why there was that disruption and trade actually declined during that time and that later led to the decline of the long distance trade. So the invasion of the Angoni brought about insecurity, just like we have noted. There was a long period of insurgency, of uncertainty because of the different invasions or conquests that Sangoni did in southern Tanganyika. So that brought about insecurity. There was no longer peace in the region due to the wars that were declared by the Angoni in southern Tanganyika. So we can also look at the aspect that Sangoni led to death of people. Many people died during these uh, many wars that Tangoni fought, and that brought about a decline in the population of southern Tanganyika. Remember, when they came in large numbers, the population increased, but because of the many wars that they fought against their neighbors, that brought about depopulation. So we can also talk about the destruction. Of property. 
many houses were burnt down, many um, uh, crops were destroyed as a result of the fight that Sangoni had with the people of southern Tanganyika. So that was destruction of property during the Angoni invasion. So the Angoni also led to bandit groups. The formation of bandit groups. Like the Ruga Ruga and Maviti. Remember we noted that the Angoni used to carry out looting in the communities that they came across. They used to steal food, they used to steal valuable property of the people in order to survive. And this later led to formation of bandit groups or groups of thieves and that used to terrorize community and these were called the Ruga Ruga and the Maviti. So they would go into different communities and steal people's property in order to survive. And that was a problem to many people because they lost their property and it still caused insecurity. So these groups were later actually hired by many communities. For example, the Nyamwezi to fight for them because they wanted to actually uh, build a strong Nyamwezi empire. And later, actually, other leaders like the coastal leaders like Abushiri also hired them to fight for him. And these were Ngoni groups that were settling in different communities, in different areas in southern Tanganyika. So that was also a reason and effect of the Ngoni migration. So you already have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We are going to add, question was out of 12 marks, but we can still add. The more we write, the better. So you can talk about the introduction of new crops. Because we said the Angoni were the last group of Bantu to migrate into East Africa. So they were actually farmers and they introduced some crops that were grown in Tanganyika. For example, millet, they introduced beans and so on. So these were grown by the people of southern Tanganyika. So the coming of the Angoni also brought about, or oh, it made many communities to adapt their tactics and use them against the Angoni. Or we can say it led to the formation of powerful empires in southern Tanganyika, for example, the Nyamwezi Empire. So when Mirambo learned the military tactics of the Angoni, he later used them to fight, to found a strong empire that was the Nyamwezi Empire. But many communities that were attacked by the Angoni, he actually they had adapted the Angoni tactics and used them to defend themselves against the Angoni, which was a good thing to them. So the Angoni also led to the defeat or decline of many communities. For example, the Hehe, the Sangu, these were all attacked by the Angoni, the Fipa people. Those were all attacked and defeated by the Angoni and later they were absorbed into their society. So they were defeated as a result of the coming of the Angoni in their different areas. We can talk about a period of misery and suffering due to the different conquests 
or wars of conquest that Tangoni declared against the people of southern Tanganyika. So there was that period of uncertainty. People had lost many of their um, loved ones or relatives. They had lost property. Trade had declined. There was famine that was caused as a result of the destruction of crops and so on. So you find out that it brought about a long period of misery and suffering among many people of southern Tanganyika, which was a negative effect of the coming of Dangoni and their settlement into southern Tanganyika. So we can conclude, and that conclusion actually earns us one mark. We can say that in conclusion, the effects of the Angoni migration into East Africa were positive and negative. Or we can still say that in conclusion, the settlement of the Angoni into East Africa affected the people in a long term and short term way, or in a short term and long term way. Or the effects of the Angoni migration were short term and long term, meaning some affected people at after a very short time and others affected people in a long term. So some took a shorter period, but some were actually uh, affected them for a very long time. So that is why we say the effects were short term and long term. And that concludes our question one for the day. So we are going to proceed to question two and we handle trade. And in this instant instance we are going to look at slave trade and we look at the reasons why slave trade increased during the 19th century Our question to A, why was there an increase in slave trade during the 19th century? So the question wants us to ascertain why slave trade increased during the 19th century. Because before the development of slave trade, the major trade in East Africa at the time was the long distance trade. Traders moving long distances from the interior to the coast to trade with the people at the coast of East Africa. But with time, slaves became the major item in the trade and traders were actually more interested in slaves than any other activity. So that brought about slave trade in East Africa. So we want to look at the reasons as to why slave trade actually increased during the 19th century. So slave trade was the selling and buying of human beings. Africans were actually raiding their communities, capturing the lonely travelers, um, getting war captives, and selling them to the foreigners. And the foreigners were actually buying them or exchanging them with the manufactured goods from their country. So that is why we are saying it was the selling and buying of human beings. So it happened in in the interior of East Africa, and many kings and chiefs were actually involved because it became a very profitable trade in East Africa. So that is why the African kings and chiefs were the middlemen in the trade. They were very interested in this in selling these slaves because that they could get a lot of income out of that. So the reasons as to why slave trade increased during the 19th century were political, social and economic.
And the first reason we are going to talk about is the profitability of the trade. People are actually getting income out of the trade. Both the Africans, uh, the Arabs that were involved, the Swahilis, and the Europeans. So the trade was profitable. So the profitability of the trade, it was uh, income generating for the Africans to actually engage in selling their fellow human beings. And because of the profits that they were getting out of the trade, that is why many engaged in the trade sold many slaves in order to get a lot of income. So that made slave trade to actually increase during the 19th century. Another aspect we can talk about is the fact that slaves were highly demanded in Europe and Arabia. There was a high need for slaves. Why? Because of the many plantations that were set up in Europe that needed slaves to work on. Plantations were set up in Portugal, in Brazil, in Britain, in Germany, and many of those plantations needed slaves to work on them. And that is why many of the Europeans came to East Africa to get the slaves, and that made slave trade to increase. We can talk about the Industrial Revolution in Europe. So the Industrial Revolution in Europe created demand for slaves because many European countries at the time had set up industries. These industries needed labor to work in them. And Africans were believed to be actually very strong and energetic and they were resistant to diseases. So that is why they were highly needed. And since industries had been set up in Europe, they had to have people to work in them. And that is why the many Europeans came to the coast of East Africa to get slaves. And that made slave trade to actually increase during the 19th century. So we can also talk about the need for domestic servants by the Arabs. So many Arabs at the coast needed slaves to work for them as domestic servants and some were being taken to Arabia to work, even in the plantations that were set up in Arabia. So that made or increased the need for slaves by the Arabs to take them to their country and to work for them as domestic servants even at the coast. So that made slave trade to increase. We can talk about the aspect the, of the uh, creation uh, of the establishment of the clove plantation at the coast by Said Said. Clove plantation. At the coast by Said Said. So Said Said was the Sultan of Zanzibar. And after the defeat of the Portuguese, the Oman Arabs settled at the coast and Said Said took over as the new Sultan of Zanzibar. So he established a clove plantation at the coast. And these plantations needed slaves to actually work on them. So that made Said Saidi to organize many caravans to come into, to come to the interior to get slaves. And that also led to an increase, to an increase in slave trade in East Africa. So we are also going to look at the need, the opening up of, but before that we can take a very short break and when we return, we can continue with that discussion.
on question 2a welcome back from the short break so let's continue with our reasons as to why slave trade increased in east africa so we left on a note that was uh, actually we were talking about the establishment of the clove plantations at the coast by said said so we can also look at the opening up of uh, french plantations at the, in the islands of reunion and mauritius at the coast which also opened need for slaves Reunion and Mauritius Islands. So these were islands at the coast of East Africa. And the French decided to open coconut plantations in these different islands. So these plantations still needed slaves to work on them. So that made the need for slaves actually very high and many of the French decided to come or join slave trade in East Africa in order to acquire labor so that they would use in their plantations. We can talk about the high need or demand for manufactured goods. talk about the high demand for manufactured goods and this time by the Africans especially the guns many empires in many kingdoms in East Africa actually needed guns and they needed other manufactured goods so that made them to raid many villages to get slaves so that they can exchange them for the manufactured goods that they needed so that also led to an increase in slave trade in East Africa. So we can also look at the introduction of guns. That made slave raid easy. The introduction of guns, when the Africans exchanged these slaves for the guns, many of them actually used these guns to raid more slaves because it, it made slave raids very easy since they were better weapons than what they were using earlier. And with the use of guns, they captured many slaves that they sold in trade and this led to an increase in slave trade in East Africa. We can talk about the role of the kings and chiefs. We noted that these were the middlemen in the trade. They actually carried out the slave raids. They made sure that these slaves reached the coast by organizing the caravans from the interior to the coast. They protected the caravans along the way and they even negotiated the prices of slaves with the Europeans. So this made the trade to go on and it became a major trade in East Africa and that is why it increased in volume. We can talk about the participation of many kingdoms. that participated in the trade. We can talk about the Nyamwezi Empire. We can talk about Buganda, Bunyoro. So when these kingdoms participated in slave trade and because it was very profitable, they needed the guns to exchange. So this made the trade to develop into 
a major trade in East Africa and actually increase in its volume. Because these communities, these empires, these kingdoms needed to trade with the Europeans because they needed the manufactured goods, they needed to get the gun. So they had to raid many of their uh, neighboring societies in order to acquire slaves that they would exchange in trade. So that also led to the increase in slave trade in East Africa. We can talk about the increase in intertribal wars. So there were wars between different tribes in East Africa. For example, the Nandi and the Maasai, Buganda and Bunyoro, Ngoni talking, uh, uh, attacking different communities. So that increased the volume of slave trade because the war captives were sold in trade. And uh, that also made many slaves available and it led, uh, made the trade to increase very highly and it became a major trade in East Africa. So in m many of these wars that were fought between communities, people were captured. And all that, those that were captured, they were sold in trade. So that increased the volume of slave trade in East Africa. So we can also talk about the Angoni invasion. Which also uh, led to the increase in slave trade. Because many of these bandit groups that the Angoni created, the Rugaruga, the Maviti, they actually raided many of the neighboring communities and captured many people. And they were sold in trade. And that still increased slave trade in East Africa. So we can also talk about the aspect that there was need for cheap labor. By many Europeans. So many Europeans actually needed cheap labor. You find out that uh, the Africans were bought at a very low price and they were taking them to do uh, heavy work in Europe and other areas. So you find out that this cheap labor was very available at the cost of East Africa. So that made the trade to actually increase. We can talk about the establishment of slave markets. At the cost. For example, Zanzibar and Pemba. So these were slave markets. Zanzibar was created by Said Said when he settled at the coast. And it was a place where slaves were assembled for sale or buying by the Europeans. So with the establishment of these slave markets, it made slaves available. Because when the Europeans would come into East Africa, they would find these slaves ready for them. And that is why they would buy and the trade would continue. So that also led to an increase in slave trade in East Africa. We can talk about the fact that these slaves are actually energetic. And resistant to diseases. So there was a belief that African slaves were actually very strong and resistant to diseases. Initially, the British were using actually the Red Indians and the Americans in their, on their plantations. But when they came, when they took some of the Africans 
they realized that the Africans were actually very energetic and resistant to diseases. So the amount of work that the Africans would do would not amount to what the Red Indians and Americans were doing. And they were actually uh, able to work uh, under very hard conditions and they would do a lot of work. So they preferred them. So this made many now to come to East Africa to get slaves than what they were using before. So that led to an increase in slave trade in East Africa. So lastly, we are going to look at the abolition of slave trade in West Africa. There was also, originally there was slave trade at the coast of West Africa. So that is where most of the European powers were getting their slaves. It was the source of slaves in Africa. So when it was, uh, British decided to abolish slave trade at the coast of West Africa, many of these Europeans decided to switch to the East African market. And they came to the coast of East Africa to acquire many slaves. So that is why uh, slave trade at the coast of East Africa became very prominent and it increased in volume due to that market that was created by the abolition of slave trade in West Africa. So there are many reasons as to why this trade boomed and we've looked at a number of them and noted that the many points you give, the more the marks that you get. So make sure you write as many as possible for you to be able to score highly. So that was our question 2A. So we are going to go on to question 2B. So question 2B is a very easy one that anyone can actually be able to uh, devise answers to because we already noted what slave trade was, we've talked about what made it to increase, we talk about the participation of the Africans in the trade. So we are going now to review what the results of slave trade in East Africa were. And the effects were positive and negative. Yes, there are some people that actually benefited from slave trade. Yet, there were also negative effects because the, uh, the leaders being that they were the middlemen in the trade, they're the ones that were involved in managing and controlling the trade, they, d they benefited highly from the trade. But the subjects actually suffered because they're the ones that were um, attacked in order to acquire these slaves and they're the ones that were sold to outside countries, they're the ones that were working on these different plantations of the Europeans. And so many things changed in the lives of the Africans as a result of slave trade. But we are going to first of all look at the positive ones and among the positive we can talk about the uh, development of kingdoms. that participated in the trade. For example, the Nyamwezi Empire, we can talk about Buganda, Bunyoro, etc. So many communities or kingdoms and chiefdoms that participated in slave trade 
actually developed because they acquired a lot of income from the trade and they were able to establish uh, big and powerful kingdoms in the region as a result of their participation in the trade. So that was a positive effect. Secondly, we can talk about the introduction of guns. Or acquiring of guns. Many of these kingdoms acquired guns because these guns were exchanged through trade and they were able to build very strong armies as a result of their participation in the trade because they exchanged slaves for guns and this uh, empowered them and their military was actually boosted as a result of their participation in slave trade. Slave trade led to the rise of prominent chiefs that participated for example people like Mirambo people like Kabaka Mtesa one people like Saidi Saidi so those leaders that participated in the trade became very prominent. Why? Because they acquired income. Remember we noted that the trade was very profitable. So they acquired a lot of income or many profits from this trade and they became prominent and rich Africans as a result of the sale of slaves in this trade. So that also made them very prominent. So we find out that uh, Said Said the Sultan of Zanzibar acquired a lot of profits from the trade and Zanzibar became um, well known and a very uh, powerful city at the coast of East Africa because of his involvement in slave trade. So the trade was very profitable and made these leaders very prominent and they acquired a lot of income out of the trade. So Africans also acquired manufactured goods. Because the sale of slaves, ours, or the uh, slaves were exchanged for manufactured goods. The Europeans had goods like cloth, they had goods like uh, sugar, they had goods like guns, gunpowder, glassware. So many of these goods the Africans highly needed. So that when they exchanged slaves for these goods, they were able to acquire some of these goods that they could not make by themselves. So that made the trade uh, have a positive effect on the lives of the Africans in East Africa. So we can now go on to the negative effects and those were very many because slave trade was more disastrous than beneficial to the people of East Africa. So to begin with, it was loss of lives. Many people died because as they were getting slaves, many communities actually um, set up raids. And during raids, which are mainly at night, they would set fire on many houses of the people. And in, the lo in, the, in such a process, some people lost their lives. Some were captured during our tribal wars. So as communities attacked others, and uh, in order to capture war captives, you find out that many lost their lives. And that later brought about depopulation. Since many lost their lives. We can also talk about the destruction of property. Because many houses were actually set on fire. Many crops were destroyed as a result of the slave raids during the capturing of slaves. So that also was a problem to the Africans because many lost their belongings as a result of slave trade. We can also look at the aspect of insecurity. Insecurity. 
especially because of the slave raids that were carried out and the inter-tribal wars. Society is had to actually attack others in order to capture many people to sell in slaves. So that brought about um, insecurity in the region. And even the slave raids that were carried out, some people were captured as they were moving. So the place was never secure because any time at um, anywhere someone would be captured and sold. So people li uh, lived uh, in, a, in that period of insurgency and uncertainty because of slave trade in the region. We can also talk about famine. Many crops were destroyed, so that brought about famine. But it also came as a result uh, of the wars that were fought. There was no peace. So many people could not actually uh, take time off to go to the gardens and produce food because the place was insecure. And it was also as a result of the fact that many of the energetic men and women were actually taken as slaves. So those that were left behind were very young, they could not take uh, part in agriculture, and some were very old, they could not still do much in agriculture. So that still brought about famine in East Africa. We can talk about destruction of families. During the capturing of slaves, they were mainly concentrating on the energetic men and women. So they would take uh, maybe the father, they would take the mother, the uncles, and so on, and leave behind the elderly and the children. So many children were left as orphans because their parents had been taken in uh, uh, as slaves. The elderly were left behind without anyone to take care of them. So there was destruction of family life because many homes and families were left destroyed as a result of slave trade in East Africa. So you can look at also a decline in the economy. The economy of East Africa was actually destabilized. Many economic activities came to a standstill during slave trade because of the insecurity that was caused during the slave raiding and the war, the inter-tribal wars. You find out that people could not take part in agriculture, trade could not uh, be carried out, and other activities like iron working, pottery, that people were engaging in could not take place because of the slave trade that was going on. So that also made it very hard for the economy to thrive. So that is why the economy declined drastically as a result of slave trade in East Africa. So there was also a period of misery and suffering. People suffered a lot as a result of slave trade in East Africa because many of them lost their families, they lost their economic activities, um, their houses were burnt down, they were always on a run, they were not able to settle in one place and enjoy themselves. And actually, they lived in a period of uncertainty. They didn't know what was going to happen at any time. So that period brought a lot of suffering and unhappiness to many people in East Africa due to the slave trade that was going on in the area. So we can also talk about the aspect that many were displaced to safer areas. Because people had to move from one area that was uh, where mayor, numerous raids were taking place. People had to leave such places to go to other areas 
that were safer. So slave trade brought about very many negative effects to the lives of the people of East Africa, though the leaders actually benefited as a result of the trade. So that is why we can conclude and say that the effects of slave trade in East Africa were majorly negative because they affected the lives of the people of East Africa negatively. We can still say in conclusion the effects of slave trade were political, social, as well as economic because we've noted some aspects that were political like the establishment of uh, kingdoms, the introduction of guns and so on and some were social like the loss of lives, destruction of property yet others were economic. So this brings us to the close of this lesson and uh, thank you so much for actually watching it. Let's meet next time. Tune in to Delta to Somme.